how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. Oh, hello. You've stumbled right on into a, a podcast. Was that intentional? Are you lost? Why don't you stop and stop and stay a while? I apologize. I'm trying something new with the podcast. I'm trying a new intro, but it's not going well. Let's try this again. Oh, hi. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Ghoulish. I am Max Booth, an undead host. And on today's episode, I am talking to frequent guest Joshua Chablinski about flying rods, a.k.a. skyfish. If you don't know what those are, all, well, I guess you've come to the right podcast. Basically, they all like those um, those floating dots you can sometimes see on digital uh, video recordings. We get into a deep little description in the episode, and we're talking about flying rods because Joshua Chablinski has a brand new short story in my brand new anthology, Lost Contact. Now, I'm not going to tell you the title of Josh's story because it's impossible to pronounce. He attempts to later in the episode. Does he get it right? I have no idea. I'm not going to try saying it. That's not, that's not what you paid me to do. You, you paid me to do little things in private. Well, the government can't track us down. Now, I don't have much else to say. I did, a, I, I did a new anthology. It's called Lost Contact. That book is out right now. The link is in the show notes. Go buy it. I think it's a great book. I spent a lot of time on it. The company, myself, Lori Michelle, we are really proud of this new anthology, Lost Contact. And I'm happy to have a new story by Joshua Chaplinski in it. I think this is a fun conversation we had about uh, flying rods. <laughs> and I... Hope you enjoy it. I hope you pick up Lost Contact. All right. Short and sweet. Just the way your metal likes it. You know, you and I met recently and um i'm just curious like you've known me for a long time online and now mm-hmm. you've met me has your has your uh, impression of me uh, changed at all since meeting me in real life hmm not really i mean you were you were pretty true to form in in real life pretty much what i expected yeah you know that's good what, what did you expect just just, just ex- except for the the piles of a cocaine you wanted to do that was really skilly. I didn't like that. You and I and other people talking, and suddenly someone comes up and goes, hey, we're going to go get some cocaine. Who wants coke? <laughs> and you said, well, it's time for me to leave. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what is this, the 80s? Wham, wham, no. wham. No, it wasn't. It's it not was, the 80s. It was 2021, man. <laughs> and it that's was not just a good in, joke. It was just in June. Yeah, it's amazing that there are still people out there prowling the streets for coke. And how easy it is to find someone who has it. I wouldn't know how to get cocaine. Would you know how to? I mean, not I didn't, but now apparently you just walk down an alley and ask. Yeah, not many alleys in Texas, sadly. Well, you know what? That's true. That's a misconception about New York City, that there are all these alleys in New York City. There's literally maybe one or two actual oh, yeah? alleys in New York City. And and no dead ends as far as i know like not like a dead end alley like where batman's parents would have gotten murdered yeah like they're just everything's a grid everything's a through street i guess and, 
who do we have to blame for that? Like superhero movies, like fucking Spider Man and stuff. He's always I, going I guess in the alleys. So. Yeah, yeah. He's always yeah, and that's supposed to represent right. He lives in New York City, right? Yeah, Batman yeah. lives in I don't know Gotham City, which is oh I yeah, mean, it's it's like a dirtier, darker New York City. Yeah, that's in what Utah. Mm, yeah that sounds about right i think gotham, it's a utah. mormon town i wish a lot of mormons in gotham so we're talking about how do you want to what do you want to call these things flying rods skyfish uh, cloud uh, giblets what <laughs> cloud giblets uh well can the can you pronounce the word that's in the title of my story nope why don't you tell the audience what this jelly is called that's in lost okay. contact okay i think that's a good place to start and with the kind of the pronunciation and maybe some uh, etymology of the the word. The story is is called the Proto-Terragote Tapes. So that's Proto-Terragote, which is spelled very oddly. And you know what? I oh, here it is. It is in front of me. I was going to say, I can't spell it if it's not in front of me. It's P-R-O-T-O, like proto, the word proto, which means original or primitive. Uh, so it's proto and then pterygote, which is the weird part. It's P T E R Y G O T E. So the tricky part is that P. But if you think of it, it's it's like pterodactyl, which is kind of a related word. So proto pterygote, um, basically, what it is is it's a um, well, there's the word proto, which means original or primitive, and there's pterygote, which is like pterygota, which is a subclass of insects that includes winged insects and secondarily wingless insects, which just is just a fancy way of saying insects whose ancestors had wings, and now these insects no longer do. So basically, winged insects and wingless insects, which is basically, it's almost all insects. Did you make up this build? No. Oh. It's an actual uh, class of insect, which comprises almost all of insectum. So we got proto pterygote, which basically means proto insect or like original insect or the like original the, insect. Or yeah, like the the uh, the forefather. What's the word I'm looking for? George Washington. An ancestors oh. of insects. The evolutionary yeah. ancestors of insects. Um, there was a guy, Dr. Robin Wooten, um, who who maybe coined the term proto-terragot, saying it was a hypothetical, a hypothetical ancestor of today's insects. And he drew like this, this rod looking thing, a little looks like a rod of uranium from the Simpsons with some wavy wings on it in a book called The Miracle of Flight. Yeah, um, I'm disappointed. I thought you made up this world. I thought you created no. this. How did you come up upon this? Are you just like a big insect fan? If so, no. I, I know a guy you should hang out with. <laughs> no, I, uh, I actually uh, do not like insects at all. I'm very scared of insects. Uh, I've been known on occasion to threaten to fuck an insect. Um, but I do not like them. It's the classic uh, flight little fuck. Yeah, <laughs> flight or fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, so what was the question? I don't like how, insects. Oh, how did I... How come? did you come upon yeah. any of this? Uh, I was actually introduced to the theory of rods a long time ago by a friend of mine, Kevin, uh, and this was in the early days of the internet when... Um, things weren't so easily debunked because the sad part of the story is that rods have pretty much been thoroughly debunked at this point in time, even though there are people who, you know, like with any sort of conspiracy theory or belief system or, you know, any sort of Trump supporter that, that they'll just double down on being wrong and stupidity and, and, and die on that hill, you know? So there are people who will die on the hill of rods, as I like to call it. And uh, but otherwise, it's pretty much been thoroughly debunked. But anyway, so this was the early days of the Internet. And a friend, my friend was like, oh, this cool, th this cool thing, you got to check out these 
things called flying rods that they're there. You can't see them with the human eye. They're only captured on film. And they are basically like I described earlier, look like little rods with fluttery wavy wings. And like they you generally only saw them in dark pictures and they would look like, like a trail of them, just like almost like, uh, like a beam of light, but broken up into dashes, like shooting across the picture or whatever. And the person in the picture is like, has no idea that these things are flying around all around them, these mysterious rods. So yeah, a friend of mine introduced me to that. And back then there was no easy answer. Like, this is why this doesn't exist. This is what it actually is. But so it was, it was a cool thing, a cool crypt, cryptid thing that uh you know people were like they're aliens or they're interdimensional beings or the, or they're proto insects that you know can't see with the human eye because they're so small and so fast and partially translucent or whatever and isn't the explanation is it's well it is insects right it's just like moths flying across the screen yeah yeah it, yeah, it has to do with all the the way when with the advent of digital technology um, and like home DV and stuff like that. It was because the simple explanation is because of the frame rate of the cameras, it would, it would create this distortion of, you know, moths or insects flying across the screen and make them look like these weird objects. So, yeah, like no one saw these things on film. It was only digital. Yeah, right. it was only digital pictures and, and digital recording. Yeah, it's not like you saw one on the Zapruder film. No, no. But that would have been cool. Maybe you may, maybe there was one. Uh, we should go back and check it out. Yeah, because then maybe yeah. Rods killed Kennedy. Dude, a uh, fly fish was the second shootle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what did you call them? Uh, flying giblets? <laughs> no, cl uh, cloud giblet giblets. Cloud yeah. giblets. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like thought I thought about that while I'm making coffee, and I thought, Haha, that's yeah. a good one. That's, that's a, good a one. keeper. A, <laughs> Thank you. It's a good band name. Um, you have a band, don't you? You sent no. me a CD once. What's up Did with I? that? <laughs> yeah. Anytime I buy a book from you, you send me music you've made. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm not in a current band. That was probably an old band that I have yeah. a huge backlog of CDs that I've no nobody wants so well, I just give them to unsuspecting people the issue is I have nothing in my house that will play a CD mm. I yeah well, they I mean I don't know if you know this Josh but uh new computers don't even have CD fucking disk drives it's I know it's crazy. crazy I don't the, understand the only thing I could actually play CDs on now is my Xbox mm -hmm. but I and I actually have a decent sized CD collection that I had refused to part with that my wife was always telling me I should get rid of. But, you know, I had that like a shelf of them displayed out in the room or whatever, you know, like a bookshelf. Cause it's like, this is the cool stuff I'm into. Someone comes over. I want them to see, you know, I got good yeah. taste in music. I got good taste in books, but then, you know, I figured I had, didn't have any ability to play them anymore. So to a uh, consolidate space, I kind of, I put them all in a, a bunch of giant CD booklets and put mm -hmm. them in a, a cupboard, but I refuse to get rid of them. Yeah, I have those CD booklets as well. I used to, my my previous vehicle, it still had a CD uh, player, but I had to upgrade because um, the last one was demolished hmm. by, uh, by, by someone else in, in the street. I was in a wreck. And then the next car I got... No CD disk drive. Mm -hmm. Now it's just useless. Just like, uh, I mean, ev everything will be useless one day, including us. Well, I mean, I figure you got you got to hold on to them because it all comes back around, just like vinyl came back around. And this is sort of unrelated, except for the fact that it pertains to me. Uh, cassettes, you know, coming back around too. And I have some friends who are like, I put a tape deck in my car and I just listen to like, my old 311 and sublime cassettes and it sounds so good the hiss is so good and yeah. i'm just like whatever dude the quality is garbage it sounds like ass <laughs> i mean even like if you listen to sublime or 311 on fucking youtube the, the quality is still gonna be ass 
Yeah, I mean, even if you listen to the most pristine, sublime recording or 311 yeah. recording or like see them live at the top of their game, it pretty much sounds yeah. like garbage yeah. coming out of a rectum and they going directly into your ear. What do you think that is? The uh, the uh, the instruments, like the technology just isn't upgraded yet? Um, yeah, I don't know <laughs> if they've really found the right medium to record to for their the complexity of the 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 tones in their music i mean now listening to trapped on cassette now that's oh well yeah i mean <laughs> trapped was made for cassette honestly yeah they should have never gone beyond that some would no, say not that's, me that's kind of where they went wrong is yeah going beyond the cassette tape because that was really their medium they they would dominate it so some people think these flying rods are aliens. What is the uh, the logic with that? Like, do they think these aliens will just like uh, not visible to the human eye and will just like hanging around people with cameras dancing? Like, ooh, look at me! Mm, like, what are I they mean, doing? What's the motive? I wouldn't think logic really comes into it. You know, anything these kind of some of these conspiracy groups, anything that they can't explain, you know, they'll ultimately attribute to aliens. Uh, it's interesting because the guy who um, quote unquote discovered rods, this guy, uh, his name was Jose Escamilla. His name's Rodney. <laughs> his name's Rodney Rodstein, <laughs> the discoverer of rods, or, aka he would call them Roswell rods because, and herein lies the alien connection is this guy, Jose, lived in Roswell, New Mexico. So when he discovered rods, he went to make a website, but found that the website rod.com or rods.com was taken, which is no surprise. And uh, so he made roswellrods.com. So that was part of the association. But also I found out this guy, Jose, I can't really read much. I didn't really find much about like what he really does, like, like what he is or how he, he, you know maintains his livelihood or anything like that but he's basically a professional rod guy at this point or at one point he was a, he was like the rod guy yeah and uh is he still alive at this point i don't know okay go on but he had before he quote unquote discovered rods in 1994 he had multiple in alien encounters according to him throughout his life uh, and one, one, the one which I find most interesting is in way back in 1966. And on this website here uh, called Roswell Rods, we review the facts and the myths. These are what we have, what seem like, um, uh, what are they called? Fuck, I'm going blank on words about the mean things. A journal. It's like these seem like journal entries written by this guy, right? Um, and I just want to read this one because it's funny about this this early alien encounter he had. So this is Jose writing this. I believe so. Okay, go ahead. It's on another website, and it says written by Frank L. Harewood, but then it it seems like this is from Jose's journal. So he like stole it from the other website or something. But it's funny because it says. This is the most pertinent information. It starts out, by now I had joined a rock and roll band called The Jesters. I we love were, it. We were very popular and touring all over the place. We had just performed in Loving, New Mexico, where I was born, at the prom for the class of 1966. And then it goes on to how they were in their van and they saw some sort of flying saucer. Okay. But I just think... I think that tells you everything you need to know right there about this guy and his credibility. A guy who was pl playing proms in a rock band called the Jesters and was obsessed with UFOs and had multiple UFO encounters. He so seems pretty cool. So this is a guy you're placing your faith in when it comes to rods. Yeah. I, I don't know. I looked up rod.com and some it's available for them. Is it? Almost five hundred thousand dollars. What about rods with an S? Rods I... go. I did. It goes to like a cowboy clothing shop. Really? 
Yeah, it's like what a, it's like rods, uh, Western clothes. What about hotrods.com? Okay, let's try that. Try that, that could, one. That could lead to anything. Hotrods.com. I mean, it's going to be killed. Oh, right? I just realized when I say them separately, hot rods, instead of saying hot rods. Yeah. When you say hot rods like that, with that emphasis, oh, I'm talking about yeah. cars. But when you say <laughs> hot rods, <laughs> I totally pictured something else. It just told me the website could not be reached. Interesting. What about hard rods or rock hard rods? Well, let's try one and go to the next sample that to see what happens. So, okay. It's, it gives me a, a message saying I can't reach it. So let's try. What was it? Rock held rods? Okay. Rock hard rods. See, this is all part of the conspiracy theory that they don't yeah. want us to know about the existence of rock hard rods. Dude, Rock Hill and Rods is somehow available on GoDaddy. That's, That's pretty amazing. Buy it right now. Uh, get this domain. No, it wants me to pay a hundred bucks. I don't want to do that. That's insane. That's fucking crazy. Uh, Go Daddy domain broker. That's not a real job. No, that sounds fake. How do you how do you get one of those jobs? College. That sounds you're bilking people out of money with a job like that. You're basically saying I could get you this domain, and then you go and look it up on GoDaddy, and then you go back to them and tell them yeah. you could get it for them for an exorbitant fee. Yeah, it's like a travel agent. Mm. Or it's also like I just found out about last night watching. Oh, did you ever watch on HBO? Uh, I think it's called How To with John Wilson. Yes. It's so good. It's the best. It's so good. Anyway, I, I just watched the first episode of season two, and there was a little tidbit in it about a, a, re a guy whose job is he's a real estate agent in Second Life. You know the game Second Life? Yes. It's kind, kind of like The Sims. And he I, basically um... sells real estate, and he charges upwards of $400 a month. What the fuck? For people to rent like islands and, and mansions and stuff for their second life character. That's crazy. Yeah. I, um, I almost stopped the podcast when you said episode one of season two. When did that come out? Oh, uh, just like two days ago. Oh my God. Boy, yeah. you know what I'm doing after this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew they had filmed recently and they wrapped. I'm convinced I'm going to end up like in the background of an episode because yeah. I was in the city when they were filming. I think yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah, he's got like years and years of random footage around New York City. So the odds are I'm in there somewhere. Did you um see that promo video him and um fucking Nathan Fieldall made? I don't think so. I'll I'll link it to you after this. I don't want to say anything about it. It's like an interview that becomes like a mini episode. Oh, okay. I'll link it in the show notes too, since we're fucking talking about it on the yeah. podcast. But the less you know about it, the more entertaining it is. You will enjoy it. Yeah. Anyway, flying rods. Uh, rods. What else do we have to say about this? Why don't you tell the folks about the story in Lost Contact? What is that about and how did that kind of generate? Okay. Well, it's it's a story. It's called the proto blah, 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 blah. the proto terragot tapes. And it is about flying rods. Uh it's uh more than that though. It's about a young woman who was very close with her father who is sort of this Jose, uh, what did I say his last name was? Scaramouche, Winnebago. Anyway, this guy, Jose. Rod Stein. Rod, Rodney Rodstein. Her father was kind of a Rodney Rodstein type. And uh, when they were younger, they were into rods and, and uh, researching rods and going on camping trips and filming rods. And then one day her father mysteriously disappears and all she's left with are his tapes. And then... Uh, she starts uh, years go by and she starts noticing these weird, weird information in some of these tapes and thinks she's getting these weird messages from her father via these tapes. And so she kind of like sets out to find him. That's basically the gist of it. It's also written in a nice um, format, like a, it's almost like a found footage story, the way it's presented. Yeah, it's got it's got a couple different types of sections. Some of them are journal entries and then some of them are kind of what takes place on the tapes and then yeah. some of them are kind of like from more from the characters pov and what they're going through 
Hmm. Yeah. Do you believe in aliens? I don't. You know, no? okay. when, it's interesting you ask. Uh, when, before the internet existed, mm-hmm. when, I, when I was in high school, I worked at a uh, B. Dalton bookstores and I was like around the time when like the X-Files first came out. I, I loved the X-Files. I was super into the X-Files. And I was, so I was all about aliens and alien cons- conspiracy. And that was back before the internet when like being into a conspiracy was cool and it was fun and it was interesting because you know like you weren't first of all you weren't a psycho who modeled your whole lifestyle after it but also like you had to actually like read books and do some research and it you didn't you didn't go online and just see millions of people who were like aliens are real i believe this crazy nonsense and anyone who doesn't believe it must die you know yeah it wasn't like I think conspiracy is a little fun when no one else is talking about it. And it's just like yeah. you kind of like getting a little bit paranoid in your house or something. Yeah. Cause like, I didn't really take it as fact, but I was like, Oh, this is cool. What if aliens were real or like, yeah. you know, the JFK conspiracy was always cool. Like, Oh man, you know, Oliver Stone's JFK is a great movie. And just like, there's a lot of literature out at the time. And I just feel like, the internet kind of opened my eyes and spoiled that for me because it showed me just how many people believe that stuff as fact and are willing to just disregard all logic and reason just to support this thing they believe in, which kind of becomes their lifestyle. It's, it's a very like, they take it on like it's a personal part of them. And that's why mm-hmm. anyone who you know, contradicts them or says it isn't true they they attack and want to slit their throat because they've basically they've made it who they are yeah the internet ruined so many things it really did it totally ruined conspiracies for me ruined aliens jfk because now there's so many real world conspiracies that just pop up out of nowhere that people believe is fact and they're affecting everyday life you know around the world and then that's not so fun with um with JFK it's crazy. Have you been to Dallas? Um, you know, I've been in and around Texas driving around and stuff, but I've never like been to Dallas and like hung out there. So I, I might have driven through, but I haven't been to Dallas or Dealey Plaza or anything like that, which I, I would love to go. Don't go to Dallas. It's a bad city. I hate it so much. Oh. But um I've been <laughs> well, a few times I've been a few times because I had to. And I've gone and visited uh, the spot that he was mm-hmm. assassinated. And it's, it's always just fucking nut jobs hanging around, handing you like pamphlets. And there's this one dude who's always sitting on the sidewalk next to the street. Uh, he has like a desk he brings and he sits down. He just waits to tell everybody the truth about like what happened. So, I mean, that conspiracy is really, I don't, that one's never going to go away i don't think yeah that's insane and also like isn't the actual spot it's like in the middle of the street and there's people constantly like standing there and lying down and taking pictures and stuff and blocking traffic and whatnot i've I, that's what i've read but the few times i've visited i haven't seen anyone jump into the street because it's a really busy street like it goes yeah. onto the. it's like a fucking express ramp onto the highway almost it's oh, not wow. like this like um empty road or anything there's always traffic on it but yeah they have like x's on the concrete and with a paint they've made a Mm -hmm. real a man was assassinated pretty morbid yeah and that's not like an official like board of tourism thing that's just some crazy person came up and was like painted a giant x i don't know about that maybe i I think so i don't think it's like (laughs) anything sanctioned or official It would be crazy if it was official, like, well, let's paint an X while that man died. I mean, you would think they could at least put up a sign to commemorate or something. Yeah. You know, you know, well, you know how you like you drive down the highway and you see, you know, bouquets of flower and crosses and stuff on the side of the road where someone obviously crashed and died. You know, you think yeah. someone would be leaving bouquets for JFK. No one, no one, no one gives a shit, man. They don't care about the man. They care yeah. about the conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, just go watch JFK. That's about as much as my interest Mm, expands. Just that movie. You a fan of that movie? Yeah, it's a great movie. But again, like I don't, you know, obviously it's not a movie to be taken at facts. No, it's just (laughs) but it's just this amazing amalgamation of all these different conspiracies. And, 
you know, just as a story about conspiracy and paranoia, like it's just a great movie. Yeah, it's just it's a good movie in the genre pill annoyed uh, movies like the pill likes few. I mean, that's mm-hmm. not I means fiction. Yeah, JFK never existed. It's yeah. all fiction. It, people think they remember JFK, but it's actually the Mandela effect. Yeah. And it, his his name was Rodney. <laughs> RFK. Everyone's heard of RFK because he was real. He existed. He was assassinated. I have fucking skyfish. Yeah. But his yeah. name wasn't Jason FK. It was Rodney FK. Yeah. Rodney. Rodney Rodenstein FK. Well, I think that's a good way, good this way to end this podcast as any man. I'm what? Talk- no, I don't. I'm not done. To- I'm not done talking. <laughs> okay. I'll, I will <laughs> mute my end. Please. I, wait, I had one other thing I wanted to say actually about this whole rigmarole. Oh, yes. One of the, the, one anecdote I wanted to relay on this podcast was not what my story was about, but the story of how the story came to be and how it came to be in lost contact. So I'll go through it really quickly because this is the third, third in the trilogy. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. You probably don't even remember any of this that I'm about to tell you. This is a third entry in the, the lost trilogy of books. Lost yeah. films being the first. No, 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 no. Lost, lost transmissions, <laughs> or lost signals. Lost signals. Yeah, lost signals being the first in which I had a story uh, called. My story was called feedback loop. Yes. Feedback loop. Yes. So I wrote a story called feedback loop. That was actually one of the first stories I probably wrote, and maybe one of the first stories for what I considered like a big open call you know this before i knew you and who you were and what kind of like what a you, fuck knew you were i mean i was writing for lit react all yeah then. but at that point i wasn't disillusioned i thought <laughs> you thought P- i was someone mmp was a big deal and by <laughs> getting into this uh getting into this anthology was a big deal to me at the time so so yeah. i got into that one and then a couple of years later the call for lost films came around and I was like, Oh, I was in lost. I was in lost transmissions or lost content. No, Jesus lost, Christ. Lost radio waves. <laughs> I was in lost signals. I'm a shoe in yeah. for this lost films. I've got a great idea. Oh, actually, you know what? Actually, I'm going to reveal a bit, a little more of, of the, per, my personal nature. I think what actually happened was you emailed me and you were like, Hey, I'm doing another one. We're doing lost films. Uh, it'd be really cool if you submitted or whatever. And so I was like, in my naivety, naivete. Is that how you say it? My naivete. Ask me how to say something. All right, sorry. My my being naiveness at the time, I thought that was like an an invite. Like, hey, you want to be in this? anthology and i said yes and then you're like all right and so i thought that kind of meant i was a shoe in at that point yeah i see i didn't fully understand how the business worked the thing is most people still assume that you will see uh some um semi-famous small press right reynolds uh whining on twiddle constantly about oh i was invited and then i was rejected that's unjust that's unprofessional yeah, but I mean, I quickly realized, oh, yeah. in, in this situation, I was invited to submit. I yeah. wasn't just saying, hey, give us a story. We'll publish any garbage you write, you know? Yeah. And so then I think, too, I was like, all right, well, let me think about it, if I can come up with an idea or whatever. And then I was brainstorming in the shower, nude as I do. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I, I started brainstorming this thing about rods and the proto-terror, you know, the rods and stuff. Yeah. And Rod- Rodney Rodkins. And so I think I had like emailed you back. I was like, oh, I got this great idea, blah, 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 about flying rods. And you were like, cool, write it. So that just in my head just kind of reinforced, yeah. oh, this is a done deal, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. It was, I mean, it was a hard lesson, you know, it, it, it took me a really long time to get over it. And yeah, I, I struggled with my confidence for a really long yeah. time after that. But it was a lesson I had to learn and every writer needs to learn. So if I could kind of help them learn it this way without having to experience the pain and the agony, yeah, you know, it's for the best. But anyway, I, I feel like I realized this even before I got the rejection. 
I was just like, hmm, wait a minute. I was like, I think I'm kind of assuming here. Like, I don't think this meant what I thought it meant, especially yeah. as like time was really got going on. Yeah. So, so whatever. So anyway, so turns out story didn't make it in and uh, I was devastated and, and wanted to kill you for a while, but I got over it. Okay. And then, so uh, and turn the page again, a cu- another couple of years, I think it was, you announced, hey, we're completing the trilogy. Uh, yeah. The lost... Uh, Giblets. Lost uh, missed connections. Yeah. Lost contact. That's it. That's this one. Lost contact. You're like, we're completing the trilogy. And then uh, you might have even sent me an email. Hey, we're completing the trilogy. Hope you submit. And I was like, no way. Fuck that. <laughs> I was like, I'm not falling for that trap again. <laughs> but then I came up with a brilliant idea. I was like, I realized that when I wrote the Proto tapes, it had tapes of stuff in it. But other than that, like it wasn't as good for the, the theme of Lost Films as a lot of the eventual stories were. You know, I think there were yeah. a lot. You, you, you know, found stuff that was more pertaining to film and had to strictly do with film. But when I saw the theme for Lost Contact, I was like, oh, you know, this this girl whose father goes missing and she's being contacted by him and searching for him. This fits this better than the last one. Yeah. So so I, I e- emailed you up and I was like, Max, I was like, you remember this story that you rejected for Lost Films? And you were like, nope. <laughs> and I was like, good, because I'm going to resubmit it. For lost contact because I think it's a much better fit and I don't want to write another story. And you were like, "All right, that's cool." And you said yes, and I submitted it. And honestly, I assumed it, it probably wouldn't get in just for the fact that it was kind of a trunk story. But lo and behold, yeah. I think something happened in the period between lost films and lost contact. Maybe you know, maybe I wrote. I wrote a novel that sold upwards of maybe a hundred copies and, you know, know, gave my name a a bit of cachet. So I think that helped securing me a spot. It did. Lost contact. I, um, I don't know why I rejected it originally because reading again for lost contact is really good. It does fit the theme. Oh, thank you. But thinking about it, like I did think about it some more because I thought, why the fuck did we, we reject this? And I do remember now it was it. You mentioned it took a long time for us to give you a decision on that one, and that was because mm-hmm. it was like one of the final ones. I mean, we don't send acceptances until we have the lineup like how we want it, and then we have to reject like the final ones that didn't make the cut. And that was one of them. It just didn't make the cut. And I think at the time. <clears throat> I thought, well, it doesn't fit the theme enough. But mm-hmm. I think I might disagree with that now. I think it's, it would have been fine in Lost Films, but we have it in Lost Contact. So, oh yeah, well. it, it all worked out in the end. Only one Pilsen has been in all three of the anthologies. Yeah, it's, uh, what's his name? It, oh, his? Paul, Paul Michael? Nah, it's Betty Rex City. Oh, Betty. What's yeah. the, he wrote Lost Signals. I always confuse his name because there's a couple writers who have the three names and they're like, either have paul or they're like pr yeah and paul I, thomas I, anderson is uh, well yeah he's this. he's he's not in this okay <laughs> um paul, paul michael anderson is in one of them i believe okay see. and michael paul gonzalez so he, yeah see paul michael and michael paul yeah fucks me up every time yeah me me too i've published uh, books by both of those guys <laughs> I, I did a uh, paul michael's uh paul michael anderson standalone Mm-hmm. And then Michael Paul Gonzalez is uh, Beneath the Salt and Sea that just came out. Yeah, you know what? When you asked me to blurb Beneath the Salt and Sea, I was like, oh, cool, a book, another book by the guy who wrote Standalone. <laughs> but I was mistaken. I also have Michael David Wilson I've published a few times. It's pretty yeah. fucking confusing. And David yeah. James Keaton. All of these people will one day go on to kill yeah, they, children. They have the names of serial killers. All yeah, them. it's not great. I, I don't know. I mean what, what do you go by uh, you have a middle I, name you use i do but not no i don't use it ever because what why? is it it's adam that's so that's decent joshua adam okay. yeah i mean whatever it's a bad. fine middle name but i don't listen i don't feel the need to 
the urge to make my name longer and more confusing. It's pretty long. I know my last name's a little tough to begin with. So just do you, um, I never asked you this. Do you prefer like in casual conversation to be called Joshua or Josh? Uh, I've never really thought about having a preference, but I think most people just call me Josh because it's shorter and easier. And I think to my ear, it sounds a little more, it's, it sounds more casual. Like Joshua seems a little, not forced, but like someone who doesn't know you well, you know? I understand Joshua. Thanks. No problem. But anyway, I just want to say about that story. Yes. What I did there is I just want to, it's like a little public service announcement. It's probably not the most professional thing. So don't think, you know, just because I got away with it, you know, so, <laughs> someone who's sold upwards of maybe a hundred books, don't think you could get away with it. And everybody start just, you know, piling on Max with the emails of trunk stories that he's already rejected because he's not going to accept them. All right. I might. Like it, it, no, it worked for me because <laughs> I'm special yeah. and I'm good, but it's not going to work for you. So please don't do it. There's also something that you'll not uh, disclosing. It's like a, a complicated um, employee, employer uh, complication. You know, well, I write for your website. Mm, so yeah. it's like, is this kind of abusive? I don't know. Is it problematic? Mm. Maybe. Yeah, it's kind of like I'm assuming because in some arenas, I'm your boss and some arenas, you're my boss. So like, you know, I do you a favor, you do me a favor. Yeah. Huh. how's um what do you want to promote you want to talk about this new podcast this new one that we're doing right now <laughs> <laughs> no the the lit reactor podcast that just came oh back. yeah sure the new yeah. old lit reactor podcast this is the third try to get the lit reactor podcast off the ground and i think we're going to be more successful because uh me and rob hart aren't the guys in charge of it yeah. per se like it's a, we got uh Rob Olson, previously of Booked, a very popular book review podcast, he contacted us and was like, you know, book is booked is ending, but I still want to do some podcasting. What do you think about resurrecting Unprintable and letting me be the host? And I was like, that's a great idea. As long as I don't have to do any work. Perfect. So I'm actually going to post the third episode in the next day or so, and we're hoping to put out about two a month. And we'll see how long it lasts this time. But uh, fingers crossed. I got a good feeling. And what else you got to promote? What do you want? What do you want to plug? I mean, uh, nothing new. I got. We got lost contact coming out this week, which yeah. by the time this comes out, it'll probably be out in a bestseller. Mm-hmm. I and hope it's got so. it's got my story, the Proto Goat tapes. If you have the book when you're hearing this and you haven't read my story, I mean, normally, you know any discerning reader would probably turn right to my story and read it first. But if you haven't done that, read the Proto tapes. I, I did have a, another story recently come out in another um, anthology called, oh, why can't I remember anything? It is called Frontiers. It's called Frontiers. It's from Owl Hollow Press. It's uh, the theme is frontiers, whether that be Western frontiers or the space is frontier or the human mind is frontier, any sort of frontiers. Yeah. And my story is a kind of like, it's what I would call a weird Western and it's called Big City Queers. Please don't be offended. That's the title. It's a, it's a heartwarming story and it's a weird Western. So the frontiers anthology, Big City Queers is my story. Cool. And uh I've also recently had two stories go up to read for free. One on Expat Press, which is popular with the kids these days, all young hip writers. So I'm proud to have fooled them and snuck in. It's a story called Stacking Plates. And then also on Bear Creek Gazette, another one of these young hip writer websites that publish all the cool kids who are like publishing like AI written fiction and stuff like that. I have a kind of an experimental story there called, um, this is a hard one. I will not remember it. Jesus Christ. Uh, something with personality assessment in the title. Objective personality assessment is the name of the story. And it's written in the form of a psychological evaluation. It's got a lot of weird textual stuff with like 
different fonts and then sentences going in different directions and that's cool two, two sentences merging to form one sentence and they mean different things when you start from different places it was a huge pain in the ass to format so i hope you go read it and enjoy it and i'm interested is that how do they format that is it like saved as a photo because like it, you... it's saved as a jpeg i yeah. formatted it i actually wrote it in excel which <laughs> with every page <laughs> yeah it was a huge pain in the ass and i like started over a bunch of different times and experimented with different things but ultimately i wrote it in excel with each page of the story being its own tab in the Excel document. So it wound up being a huge Excel document with like 25 tabs. And uh, then I transferred that to PDF. So it would like lock the formatting and I gave it to them. And I was like, I don't know how you're going to display this, but it can't change from this. And they, they figured it out. So. You might be the only one who's written fiction in Excel. That I is know. insane. Yeah. It, it's insanely stupid. Oh my Cause, god! Because it was a huge pain in the ass. Send me a link to that, and I'll show it in the uh, the show notes. That's crazy. Sweet. I also want to read it, and I don't know what the magazine was called anymore. Bear Cloud, Creek. Cloud Bear Creek Monthly. Is it Rod Rod Square? Perkins. I'm not going to remember this anyway. Okay. Um, okay. And then That's as it? you and as always, a paradox twins is out there. If you want to be the 100 and something <laughs> reader, you seem to have a grudge. <laughs> not a grudge just a kind of i'm embracing reality yeah you know sucks and it's sad and depressing you know what i i look at it more as one reader at a time one reader at, at, at a time yeah and books you know i mean they don't fucking just go away they continue and they yeah, get new lives exactly. like i think fucking um negative space is gonna keep getting like that's oh, a book yeah. that kind of came out no one read it but recently yeah. it's, it's skyrocketing and probably because of you you kept talking Me, about oh, well, it listen you, if i if i could take credit for that i will because i i thought i love that book i thought it was a great book and and i'm very happy that it, it does seem to have legs like yeah. people keep people are slowly discovering it uh, it's a great book, Negative Space by B.R. Yeager. Great book. Yes. And so is the Pilodox Twins by Joshua Adam Chaplinsky. Yes, Joshua Adam Chaplinsky, Rod and Stein. Dot com. And uh, yeah, my novel, The Paradox Twins. Okay, I'm going to end it with that. I'll allow it. And that was Joshua Chiblinski talking about flying rods, skyfish, cloud giblets, all three of those things. They all the same thing. We talked about that one topic and that one topic only. Go pick up Lost Cont- Fuck. Go pick up Lost Contact, an anthology out now through Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Buy it at perpetualpublishing.com